Hey everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. I'm really excited about today's episode. We finally get to talk about a series that I've wanted to talk about from the beginning because this is actually um, uh, Jason and I, you know, Jason, my uh, partner in crime on a lot of these uh, casts here. Um, he and I decided to try like doing, you know, a little reading group sort of thing years ago now, this is probably like four years ago or something, and we were both, you know, we, we thought about some different things, we thought about, you know, doing some Doctor Who books, etc, etc, we thought, let, let's start with something more manageable, something that isn't like an entire series, like a Star Trek or a Doctor Who or whatever, let's just take one little, you know, three to six part sort of thing. So we decided on War of the Spider Queen. So we, we both started reading this, and essentially we had very similar reactions. <laughs> First of all, absolutely gorgeous covers by Brahm. Want to say that? An intriguing premise, I guess. And you know, before I even start on the premise, let's go ahead and start in on book one, because that's one of my issues with book one. You know, let me just say at the beginning, if you're a huge, huge fan of this and you cry if other people disagree with your opinion, stop listening now. <laughs> so I was pretty excited about this because, you know, at, at the point that I was reading this, um, I knew who Paul S. Kemp was. I don't think I'd actually read any of his stuff yet, but I knew who he was and I thought he seemed like a cool guy. Um, uh, or sorry, I, I said that wrong. Philip Athens. I knew who Philip Athens was and I thought he seemed like a cool guy because I liked Paul S. Kemp because I had read Twilight Falling at this point and Kemp had mentioned that Athens had went to bat for him. And I liked Paul S. Kemp. So the last two books in the series are Philip Athens and Paul S. Kemp which, you know, made me curious to get towards the end. And Lisa Smedman at that point, I hadn't read anything by, but I thought, oh, a female writer in the realms who's not Elaine Cunningham, because I'll admit, you know, I hadn't read any of her stuff, but all of it looked boring to me at that point. So I thought, oh, this is, you know, this is interesting. And I remember liking Thomas M. Reed, and I think I had read Richard Baker at this point, and I liked him. And I was like, oh, I don't really like buyers, but if I can make it through buyers, then I can do okay. And it's weird because now, my opinions have shifted quite a bit on a lot of these authors, but anyway, that's where I was going into it. So I was kind of excited to get further and further along. Dissolution is, I think, just horrible. Uh, it is just a... Uh, here's, here's what ruins the book for the most part for me. The fact that the back of the book, or, you know, just any sort of, like, plot synopsis for the entire series makes it so the first third or so of the book is just useless. Uh, you know, it's like this series is... Lolth has stopped responding to her people, and nobody knows, or she's stopped respond responding to the drow, and nobody knows why. But because this is basically given away on the back of the book, I was really confused for a long time why nobody was talking about it, even though it was obviously true. And then somewhere around a third of the way through the book, uh, the main character, who is interestingly named Faroon, not spelled exactly the same way, but essentially it seems to me like it would be like naming a child here Earth, U-R-T-H or something. So that's a little odd, a bit of a strange choice that they had going on there. But he tells Rild, his uh, buddy, who's um, uh, more of a um, swordsman than he is, he tells him about this and says that, you know, it's this big secret and blah, 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 blah. And so essentially that starts the story along but it's like, up to that point, I didn't even realize it was supposed to be a secret. I just thought it was weird that nobody was talking about it, because obviously Loth isn't answering the prayers. Yeah, so that was a problem. You know, and, and I asked Jason if he wanted to co-podcast this with me, and he passed because, uh, you know, he kind of wants the memories to fade away as quickly as possible. So I don't blame him there. But I remember one of the problems that he had with uh, this book, especially in the series in general, is that it takes place in the Underdark. We should feel that oppressive difference in it. And he said that he never felt like they took advantage of that setting in a way that made you feel like you were there. Essentially, it was just, you know, because the drow can see in the dark, etc., etc. It just feels like we're in a city. Any city. The big difference between this and any other city, or most of the other books, of course, is the morality of the characters. It's very different. They worship, you know, a, a chaos demon, essentially. And so everybody has this uh, mercurial morality, I guess, would be the best way to go about talking about it. Uh, y you know, we have, like, for instance, there's a, there's a point in the end of the first book where one of the main characters turns his back on the other and essentially leaves him to die, even though it would be beneficial for him to keep him with him at all times, uh, since he's, like, protected his life time and time again. But he's basically like, you know, you're here to protect me, the trap had to be sprung, you're protecting me. 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm all for it, but every time it happened in these books, it felt forced to me. It felt like it just didn't work at all. So that was frustrating. I'll tell you, the, um, well, maybe I should wait to talk about that till after I get through all the books that I made it through. So essentially, Dissolution, the first book by Richard Lee Byers, we have the mystery explained to us, then we have this uh, giant um, uh, siege take place upon Menza Baranzan, which fails, of course. But we see the, the first kind of stirrings of the people who would kind of be happier if Loth weren't there, rising up and trying to take over. They fail. Insurrection, the second book by Thomas M. Reed, is slightly better, but it suffers from the fact that it is exactly the same plot as the first book, except we see it happen to, I think it's Ched Nassad is the name of the uh, name of the city. And of course, it, it succeeds there. Ched Nassad is destroyed. It falls into the abyss and it's uh, hurled down, blah, 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 blah. But except for the climax, essentially it's the exact same story, just with a few new characters and a very slightly different setting. Uh, the whole reason they go to Ched Nassad, the party goes, is they're sent there um, you know, I, I can't even actually remember the main reason, but I do remember, I think it's Faroon, who's going around to um, different races that are there and, and asking them if Loth is answering their prayers. Which I'm like, this makes far more sense than the main plot. But anyway, so that's Insurrection. Then Condemnation is the third book. That's by Richard Baker, and I liked it a lot better, but by that point it was just getting, you know, I, it, it was just repetitive, repetitive, repetitive crap and, and just so annoying. And Condemnation has this glimmer of hope because they're thrust into the outside world, and I thought, okay, this will give us a chance to open up the characters and explore lots of different things. Like, how does a group of normal drow act in the real, you know, the real world, quote-unquote, that's a stupid way to put it, but you know what I mean. And essentially they're there for like three chapters and all it does is it, it sets up really painfully obviously the fact that one of the characters is going to start worshipping, um, oh I can't remember, but the, the goddess that drow that go to the daylight world worship usually. Uh, and um, it feels like there was no real reason for that to happen except that it needs to happen for what they want to happen later in the story, and, you know, I, I can't fault Baker. I'm sure he was forced into this kind of tough decision, and he had to deal with it, um, and he, he did the best that he could. I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't blame him. Um, and then, pretty quickly, they get back to the Underdark, and the climax of this book is essentially them all going to Lolth's, uh, the, uh, oh god, what are they, totally blanking on the name of it now, but, you know, the Dark part of the abyss where Loth lives and they essentially go right up to her door, knock on it, and she doesn't answer. And it's like, well, duh, she's not answering your prayers. Did you think going to her house? I mean, like, literally, it's like they go to her house and knock on the door and she doesn't answer when she hasn't been answering the phone for weeks, you know? And it's like, do you really think that was wise? Like, what was the point of that? It just felt so ridiculously time-wasting and like, you know, we gotta stretch this out over six books. Like, this is the thing that I don't get. I love the idea behind War of the Spider Queen. You know, the idea behind the series in a meta, meta, meta way is, let's do this big series that's a big event with um, a setting that everybody loves, which is the Underdark, Menzo Baranzan especially, you know. Everybody wants to know more about the drow, except me, uh, you know. But let's do this big event with them and attach somebody who's a bestseller in the realms and somebody who's written about the Underdark a lot, put their name on it, and, you know, I guess he wrote the little two-page introductions from Walt's point of view, put his name on it, and we're going to feature new talents that aren't, um, that aren't really seeing the sales that we want. This will get people interested in those authors because of these books, and then they'll hopefully go out and read their other stuff. You know, somebody will read Dissolution by Richard Lee Byers, and hopefully they'll buy the um, uh, that Elf trilogy he did, or the the Evil Stone, whose name I keep forgetting. You know, that book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that's an excellent idea. I think that's an awesome idea, and I'm glad that they did it again with Fourth Edition with the Waterdeep stuff. You know, putting Ed Greenwood's name on it, and he writes an introduction, and then you get the book. And it's like, I, I really hope that that works. I think the failing here is the fact that they tied all of these authors' hands so much and didn't allow them to write a good story. And the big event is Lolf moves. There it is. That's the, you know, their big, big spoiler. Sorry, she moves from one place to another, and while she was doing it, she's unavailable. The end. That's it. That's all that it's about. 
not really a big event, interesting, or, you know, anything at all in here. So after that, even though the three authors coming up were ones that I were more excited about, we just both gave up. We were like, we cannot take this. We wikied it to find out kind of how it ended up simply because we were kind of curious, like, is this leading somewhere that's exciting? And we found out Lolth moves. <laughs> and basically every character gets eaten to death by spiders. I mean, that's really how it ends, except Quinful, which is so frustrating. But um, yeah, most of the characters just get eaten to death by spiders. And it's like, well, all right, I guess that's, you know, it, it just felt like Again, with the mercurial morality, it feels like there are a lot of things like that that are in there simply to be there to, you know, be like, oh, isn't this spooky and evil? And ah, they're drow. They're not like your typical heroes. You know, you want to know how to write a dark elf. Go out and read the either the prologue or the first chapter of the Malice Darkblade series by Dan Abnett and Mike Lee. That puts any of this to shame. Seriously, just read that bit. It's it's on the boat. It's where Malice is taunting one of the slaves, and you'll see what I mean. It's so horrific. Didn't really like that series overall, because then essentially, like, two chapters in, he's forced to be good because of, like, a curse or whatever. And anyway, it doesn't matter, but read that bit if you want to see how I think uh, Dark Elves should be written. So, yeah, I feel bad because I... Overall, I've liked Spendman. You know, I her Zambia book didn't blow me away, but overall I've liked her. Uh, Philip Athens, you know, generally overall I've liked him, and I, I, I think he of all of them here, since I'm pretty sure he was the editor on these, probably has, you know, I'm guessing that his book probably feels the best out of all of them, the best fit, and Paul Kemp I absolutely love, but even he has said, you know, it was kind of hands tied because he feels like the thing that he does best is create characters, and he really wasn't allowed to do that in Resurrection. Let me tell you something I did like, and I'm not sure if other people had a problem with this. I haven't even seen most people comment on this, but I liked the fact that the characters were very different in each book. Obviously, each author had their own favorites and wrote them slightly differently. Like, for instance, in Dissolution, Faroon is this uh, maverick. He's this Han Solo character who, you know, does things in a... His, he's still evil, but he does them in a way that, you know, he's so far above mentally all these stupid bitches who run Menza Baranzin, and he's so much cooler than everybody else, and he's always four steps ahead of them, and he's just the best person there is. And Rild is this just amazing sword fighter, and he is like, he can take down anybody. I mean, the thing that I really loved about this book was, essentially in the climax, there's this bit where Rild just has to take on, like, eight million people. I mean, it felt like he essentially took down a house by himself. And there's this great bit where he's just like beaten, bruised and in the middle of this strange area. And he realizes he doesn't know where anything is and he is not really sure what his next step should be. So he just kind of like meditates for a while. It's very much like that bit in um, episode one of Star Wars where, you know, you're trapped between purple doors you meditate until you can go out and fight. And so he just, like, meditates, hangs out, and then a new swarm of people comes in, he just gets up, grabs his sword, takes them all down. And I thought for sure he was going to die there, because I'm like, they're going to be all, you know, we're hardcore, blah, 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 and, and my favorite character was going to die. But no, he survives, which is crazy. And then at least through the next two books, he's just kind of quiet. He hangs out and kind of gets into battles, but really doesn't do anything or have any character. And that was a little bit frustrating, but I was okay because in book two, <laughs> suddenly Vala, I think his name is Vala, but I could be wrong. I know that's Claudia Black's name on uh, Stargate, so maybe I'm just mixing it up. There starts with a V. He's this guy who was in the first one a tiny little bit, and then suddenly he's in the second one, and he's kind of this thief character, and all of a sudden he has this really great character, and he's the one that I found far more interesting, and obviously the, uh, uh, the demon characters or whatever who go on into Empyrean Odyssey. You could tell that Reed had a soft spot for them, of course. Um, like Vashok Roar and Ebon or whatever. Uh, so they... Uh, uh, but, you know, Vala suddenly becomes the most interesting character. But still, Faroon is, you know, three steps ahead of everybody else. Quenthal plays a much bigger role in this one, and she's still just this annoying bitch. And it's like, God, you know... Why do they ever decide on a matriarchy? It just it, it plays so horrible. I mean, it's not like a patriarchy is better, but, you know, a, a any sort of ruling class. It's horrible. She's so annoying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then in Condemnation, Richard Baker pulls off this coup and somehow makes Quintel feel like this woman who's 
in charge, slightly stuffy, but having to put up with all of these morons under her, and so of course she comes across like a bitch because her patience is at its wit's end, or she's at her, her patience... <laughs> I mixed like three metaphors there. I wanted to say it was at her wit's end, frayed and unknotted, but, you know, it's it's... She's always just having to put up with these pathetically stupid people who she's like six moves ahead of, and and the the frustration at that makes her really bitchy all the time, and she actually knows what's going on and, and understands why they should be doing certain things and is just putting up with their antics. And Faroon comes across as this ridiculous fop. And, uh, you know, it's it, I could be mixing that up. It could be Insurrection where he's a ridiculous fop. And this one he could just seem stupid. But in any case, his character changes drastically between books. I think some people would have a problem with this. And I'm shocked that I didn't see more people harping on this. I think it's fun. I think it really like helps bring the series to live, to life, you know. Um, and then I think in the end of the second book, the guy who was my favorite character, um, or maybe it's the beginning of the third, because I know basically once they decide they're gonna go into Loth's domain, you know, in the abyss, he's basically like, well, this is a bit out of my realm, so I'm just gonna scatter, because uh, you know, going into the abyss seems kind of dumb to me and beyond my capabilities, which I love, because I was like. Finally, somebody here has some sense. So yeah, it's uh, I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. I could see others being frustrated by it. And I, I really kind of wanted to read at least little bits of the last three, simply to find out who's the likable character in this one. It could be total surprise. Who knows? Um, but in the end, they're all eaten to death by spiders, or eaten alive by spiders, so who cares anyway, right? So yeah, <laughs> War of the Spider Queen just great intentions and a horrible horrible misfire when it came to the actual books so yeah i am so excited that we got through that one i think except for twilight falling which we'll probably get to here pretty soon we are now through the books that i have actually read in any way shape or form so everything from here on out should be a surprise Woo! i hope you're as excited as i am this is michael t bradley realms remembered